And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. From 1955 to 2001, Watson Island served as a pulp mill, following its use as a weapons storage facility for the Canadian military during World War II. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 2001. When the clock ran down yet again on Skeena Cellulose this month, only to be restarted by the BC courts, the province announced it was negotiating a sale to Mercer International of Switzerland. And one of the key components of the deal was a $20 million contribution from a group of Northwest communities because so much of their economic health was at stake. We're basically uh, blue collar towns and, uh, and uh, our prosperity is, is, like I mentioned, no small part to, due to the workers. And uh, we're committed to this project. Um, we've got a strong balance sheet and uh, we're not, not saying that we're throwing this money out the window, but uh, uh, we, we expect repayment on it. But uh, we, we've got to be accounted. We've we're, we're, uh, got four branches in the Northwest and uh, Two of them, uh, Terrace and and, uh, and Prince Rupert, are solely dependent on on, on the on the mill and mill operations. The community's mayors got together in Smithers in October to discuss what they could do to keep the ball rolling past the court's cutoff date of November 5th, and that's when they formed a limited partnership. The other communities uh, had expressed very much the same concern as we had. Uh, Terrace had expressed the same concern that if it went into bankruptcy, it could ha would have a huge impact. So, and they uh, were very supportive of the idea that Skeena go ahead uh, as uh, a going concern as it had in the past. Prince Rupert was taking on the biggest portion of the community investment, $12 million. Terrace is on the hook for $5 million. Port Edward and the Northern Savings Credit Union, $1 million each, and New Hazelton, a quarter million. Two other communities which had been involved in the discussions, Hazelton and Smithers, decided to opt out. But the agreement depends on a lot of things. In Prince Rupert, for example, its involvement is contingent upon the city being repaid the $11.5 million in back taxes owed by SCI. We have no interest in, in investing in a pulp mill unless it's to protect our community's economic viability. Uh, the second thing is that the tax situation has to be settled to our satisfaction. Uh, we want to see the contractors paid out. We want to see a viable business plan that makes good investment sense. Port Edward is also counting on payment of back taxes, $1.2 million in its case. We have no more reserves. And uh, I guess even further reaching is if the company is not viable and doesn't operate, um, well, where are we going to get the tax money from, the tax base? In Terrace, there is the matter of logging and road building contractors and suppliers who are owed several million dollars. The Mercer deal, if, if it proceeds, uh, indica indicates that they will pay those contractors. They've said that to me personally, and they've said that to everyone who asks them. And again, uh, Roger Harris has been very instrumental in, in getting that done as well, so uh, he's done a good job there. And the credit union's involvement hinges on Mercer producing a good business plan for SCI. Our, our major interest would not be in terms of making a significant profit on any upside, but ensuring that the downside of a possible inv uh, investment would be uh, to a certain degree protected. So uh, we're looking at a, a fairly quick uh, resumption of business. We are looking at within certainly the second or third year, a, a positive cash flow being generated by the operations uh, so that somewhere down the road, whether it's five years or six years or however long, uh, we'll be able to uh, come up with an exit strategy for our investment. One thing the communities all agreed on is that the money would not simply come from tax dollars, although where exactly it will come from is a bit cloudy, and certainly the contractors expect to be asked to pony up. Well, I think the, the hope is that contractors and people that operate for SCI or what formerly was SCI will contribute the funds on a monthly basis to uh, carry the debt. Um, the response to that is lukewarm. I won't say cold or hot, but lukewarm. And the majority of 
people want to see what the business plan is first and see if it looks like a viable business plan, then that, that would be more encouragement to, from an investment standpoint. The workers at the company's Northwest operations are also being asked to contribute through their unions. The membership of this local union voted unanimously to support the mayor's uh, proposal and they have agreed to put two and a half percent of their wages into trust fund to make up any shortfall in interest. Uh, if the population of, of terrorists approves the $5 million loan. Now, Holcher says non-unionized workers in Terrace have also agreed to the same terms. SCI's long-suffering contractors are a bit leery about it all because they've been let down before and have lost millions of dollars. In fact, some even wonder if an SCI bankruptcy would be such a bad thing. Well, it could go either way. I think uh, one of the big fears is bankruptcy might lead to the dismantling of the uh, manufacturing facilities around here. And if that were to happen, it would be quite a long time before the contractors can see any kind of a steady business, but there is a lot of contractors that feel that maybe bankruptcy is the best option. But those contractors are in the minority because most of the people we spoke with are extremely fearful of an SCI bankruptcy. That there will be uh, have to be uh, cutbacks uh, in city services, but also just the uh, situation for businesses in, in uh, the community and uh, the residents of the community is going to be quite difficult. In the area, Rupert, whatever, and everything, there's a tremendous amount, 5,000 people, maybe 6,000. The spin-off is fantastic. Look at the local stores here in Prince Rupert. My thoughts are the same thing as Don uh, Scott's is. We're worried. We don't know what to do. If this mill goes down, we're in deep, deep trouble. We'll survive, but it's not like it was in the old days. If the jobs go, this town is going to suffer a lot because uh, the property values will drop and most of the communities are fighting to retain the industry they have. Plus, they're trying to get more industry in the town to have better tax base. And it will help people if we are able to keep this mill running. The, ri the ripple effect is, is so wide ranging, I'd rather not think about it because we need that. We need those, uh, those people here to support us. The communities certainly don't see their financial involvement as open-ended, and they want to make sure there's a way for them to exit without kissing off their investment, the way the provincial government basically has done. And while there are all sorts of potential landmines that could blow this deal apart, the communities cling to guarded optimism. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thanks for staying with us. The son of a guitar player and music teacher, Valentin Pointes, he started playing the guitar at the age of six. As an adult, he shifted to jazz fusion styles. Better known as the stage name Alex Cuba, he and his twin brother, Adonis, worked as a duo called the Pointes Brothers. Let us return to the archives to see the Pointez brothers on stage in Kitimat. It was good. They were fabulous. Um, they came with their dad. And this is one of the groups, uh, they were nominated for Juno. And we probably caught them at a time when we can afford them. Um, they're now going over to Europe and becoming more well known in the States. So um, I think, you know, we uh, enjoyed it while we could. Their style is unique, and the Puentes Brothers concert at the Mount Elizabeth Theater in Kitimat was definitely a success. When you put a CD out, um, the, you write a song once in a while. You want people to listen to the music. So everywhere, whatever it is a theater, ready for us to play in color. And when a performance is virtually flawless, you'd imagine so was the planning to pull it all together. And behind the scenes, dedicated volunteers within the various concert societies work very hard to make it happen. But at the same time, each area's preparation is unique. We try in our season to uh, 
have a, 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 a balance of um, uh, material. Um, most people think of us as being strictly classical music, but uh, these days uh, we're not totally that. Uh, we have everything uh, um, from uh, folk to world to jazz, uh, certainly the, the classical is represented. Uh, probably not much uh, country music or pop or rock in our season, but uh, it's 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 pretty has pretty wide appeal, and uh, I think people are reasonably happy with what we bring in. There are many factors um, that you take into consideration when putting together a concert season. Uh, one of the main ones is uh, what would appeal to your community, and um, although we do work with the other communities up north. Um, each community has a distinct personality and distinct needs and so you'll find that in Kitimat for instance we have three different shows that are coming to Terrace and that is because we um, feel that these shows meet our community's needs or we want to expose the residents of Kitimat to something different and we feel that uh, the people here are very open to all kinds of new experiences. If we can get three bookings, it's usually uh, attractive for them to come and they want a tour and they sell CDs at the shows and that's, you know, all gravy and they like that. And they like connecting with people too, you know, um, because everybody had to start out somewhere. So, you know, they, uh, I mean, we've had uh, um, all sorts of uh, entertainers that have come here and won Junos after they've been here. We try to get them, because after they win the Juno, they're a little bit more expensive, but uh, we try to get them just before they just hit the mark, and sometimes we're uh, pretty good at uh, picking out, well, you, you know quality when you see it, and if you're enjoying yourself, then I know probably the majority of the other people in the audience are too. The BC Touring Council for the Performing Arts plays a huge role when it comes to discovering the right performers to meet different community needs. Each spring, members gather to watch a number of performances, meet the artists and the agents, and try to book performers who want to tour throughout the Northwest. We're also looking to um, bring people, performers that have an established reputation, um, who are perhaps uh, garnered Juno Awards, but we're also bringing in performers who are starting out and who have um, fantastic ability, but haven't, you know, they're just starting out in their career. And so they're working their way through the smaller communities, uh, building up their experience so that when they eventually do get out, into the larger communities that um, they have a good solid um, musical background. Funding can be a struggle, but within all of the Northwest Concert Society's volunteers and community support helps to turn the society's dreams into reality. We get most of our funding from ticket sales, from support from the population coming out to our shows. We get some uh, support from businesses in the community. Uh, we go out and solicit those funds. And uh, we do get a very little support from the provincial government. And I'm sorry to say that uh, with the cutbacks generally in the province, uh, I don't see that that funding will continue. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. The Terrace Concert Society books concerts two seasons ahead while working with other communities. Let us return to the archives with then president Karen Burkadell. We're always looking for people with uh, energy and skills, and you just have to have the time and the commitment uh, to, to dedicate. And um, uh, I couldn't do this job without the volunteers, and that goes for all the volunteers on the other concert boards in the area. I mean, um, it, there is a lot of work that goes into putting on a show, and uh, people you know, don't realize that uh, come curtain time. 
but there's a lot of preparation and coordination that goes into getting the brochure out, getting the tickets organized, and uh, putting posters up, and making sure that the evening runs successfully. We're often asked about larger uh, events, you know, such as, for example, the Vancouver Symphony. You know, people say, gee, we'd love to have the symphony back. Well, it's, it's very expensive for a group that large to tour. And nowadays, there isn't a lot of touring assistance that there once was. Uh, there, there is some monies available to artists through the Canada Council, but not certainly not as it was in the past. Part Rouge, one of Canada's leading bilingual groups, recently toured our region. We've been around for so long that uh, now uh, people just expect that we're going to be singing in not only French and English, but in other languages as well. And it's, it's a bit of our trademark as well as being a family and having the harmonies. I think uh, that's a bit of our trademark is that we, we're bilingual. Northern BC is, it's, it's stunning. It's just beautiful. So we've had a great time. And we, I, I like meeting the people. The people are really what I like to see. Uh, you meet different people in different contexts. And it's all done for the love of performances, whether it be theater or music. The society presidents tend to take on their roles as full-time positions, and they say they are dedicated to bringing you the best performers they can. Life is a mystery, you know? Yeah, we are today, and I don't know where we want to be tomorrow. So we are enjoying, you know, moment by moment our life. And let's pray and let's hope that it's going to be for a long time. I tell you a little secret. I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to, I don't know to do anything else than music. So I have to do it. I have no choice. <laughs> it will be until my last day. Most of the time, you know, people come in there, you know, not quite sure what's going to happen on stage when they come out of the theater at the end of the concert. They're pleased. And, and that's what so I think a lot. You know. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Terracite Casey Brahms Wildlife Art is featured on Netflix Meat Eater and championed by conservation groups including Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance and Wild Sheep Society of BC. In this final segment of Bomba Connection, we return to the archives to meet Casey's grandfather. Some historians choose to capture the past with words, while others do it through the visual element of art. 77-year-old Casey Brom of Terrace is passionate about the Northwest heritage and expresses it through his sketches. Brom was introduced to art at an early age in Holland, where he was taught the principles of drawing by his father. It was a family pastime for Brom to sketch every night with his father and his siblings. We had uh, a small blackboard, and my dad always had some chalk that was put on the table, and he made a square, squares on the, on the blackboard, and then he drew a duck or a boat anchor or something in the first square, and then I was the oldest. I had to put it in the next square. My sister under me had to do it in the third square and so on. And of course, the younger the children got, the worse the picture looked. <laughs> it will be 50 years this spring since Brahm moved to Terrace and he continues to do art every day. After I retired, then I really dug into it again and still draw every day. Yeah, I'm 77 now. I still love to do it. My eyes are still good and my hands are still steady, so that's the way it goes. Brom has always been keen about museums and history and says he enjoys preserving a bit of the Northwest past through his art. Here in Terrace, the history is not that old. If you come from Holland and you walk to Amsterdam, you see the gable ends from the 15 and the 16 and the 1700s, things like that you do not see here. But if you don't preserve the history now, it's lost. Brom has dabbled with many different styles of art throughout his years, but it was an art critic from Victoria several years ago that encouraged him to pursue sketching. And he comes up to me and he said, is that your work? I said, yeah. And he looked it all over and then he said, where did you start it with, with pen and ink? Said, How do you know? Well, he said, I can see it. I said, oh, no, he knows what he's talking about. And he comes to me and he says, shall I give you an advice? 
You should drop all your color. You should get more colorful in black and white. And that's what I've done and I've never been sorry. A mural designed by Brahm featuring Terrace's original train station with the train pulling in will grace the side of a Terrace downtown building on Calum Street. The mural is set to get underway in spring 2002. There's a lot of time and effort put into his um, drawings that he did that we have to use to put on the wall and he's blocked them all off in squares so it makes it easier for whoever is going to, to paint it. And, and I think we all in Terrace appreciate Casey and all his work that he does for artwork. Brom's attention to detail and lifelike scenes have drawn many admirers who appreciate how each piece tells a story. You can read it in a book, but I think when you can actually look at a picture and, and see uh, a riverboat, you can almost imagine it traveling down the Skeena or, uh, you know, his pictures, they do, they just come alive. I, th I think it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's just... No, I think he does a great job, and I think it's very important. I mean, some people write it, and he does it in the art. Brom has seen the tools of his passion change over time, and he now uses fine Indian ink felt pens made in Germany. Although he enjoyed using the traditional nib and ink pot, he says sometimes there are risks involved, but even mistakes can turn out to be purposeful. Now, I drew that eagle in the sky because I stuck my pen in the ink pot, and there was a little hair on it, and I got to the sky, and it was a big black line. Now my picture was ruined and the rest was all finished already. And now what I'm going to do? And then my wife says, make an eagle out of it. And that's what I done. Now it's just like it belongs there. Brom has never taken an official art lesson, but says the key to his work is perspective. Then you start drawing little clouds and you make them a little bit bigger as you come closer to you. And you can already see that that line is disappearing. Through all his many pieces of art Brom has created, his favorite can be seen in his home studio, propped on the shelf. It was a sketch Brom did more than 60 years ago in Holland, when he was only 12 years old. Brom says he is fortunate to still have the ability in his 70s to do such detailed work. When I have nothing to do and there's nothing on TV but me interested in me, I'm doing some behind. More than 50,000 people each year do this. People from all over the world, and they come from every corner of the world to come and understand Aboriginal people in Canada. And uh, this is quite a unique setting because uh, I don't know of any other place that you could go into an original longhouse and have a guided tour and the culture explained. It's a culture that's been preserved here at Kisan. 25 years ago, a village was created, fashioned after an authentic Kisan village. Well, thousands of years ago, a uh, village stood here in this very site on the Skeena River, and um, a replica was built of a true uh, built village, what it would look like, um, so that people could come and understand our culture better and, and have a feeling of what it was like to be in a longhouse and how the Gitsa people survived on a day-to-day -day basis. Wow. With the progression of treaty oh, talks and Native geez. Enlightenment, Here's an is looking forward to playing an important green. role in Hazleton for another 25 years. I was just looking. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Picto. <laughs>